That's a good question. <laughs> it's something that we constantly debate about art fairs. It's something that we as gallerists constantly debate about. Um, you know, there was a period um, before COVID uh, or even during COVID where um, fairs have lost their magic, let's say, um, for visitors, um, particularly for um, collectors and clients and collectors and curators, because there were so many fairs and it was so hard to focus. Mm -hmm. Um, and then certain fairs are, let's say, more important than others based on um, where you are, um, where you're located, and what your program is. Um, but then, um, and then there was a period during COVID where um, um, there, we found out that people were um, still enthusiastic about contemporary art and acquiring contemporary art and finding out more information about a contemporary art um, without necessarily going to a fair. Mm -hmm. But I think that, um, but coming out of it, I think there is definitely a resurgence and a desire to be in fairs and to represent uh, and to be in fairs and to, to represent oneself in fairs um, because um, we all, let's say, miss that. Mm one personal contact and and for us in particular our program is um let's say not um it's ten tends to be a bit more conceptual in nature mm -hmm. and therefore requires our presence um to um talk it through mm -hmm. so there's definitely um less maybe I mean, there's of course the commercial financial side, which sometimes it's important to hack to to represent, even though um, obviously fairs cost uh, a huge amount of money to be in. But more importantly, it's 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 how um, our artists are seen um, in to an audience for the first time. Many of this, you know, they're. Um, not everyone is located in London and not everyone comes to London. So it's an opportunity to see work in person. Uh, That's interesting. So it's also your duty. It's, it's a way to actually support your artists. It's, it's our kind of our primary uh, focus when we come to fairs. Um, fairs are always, um, I mean, of course, you can try to quote unquote hedge your bets, etc. But often, um, you know, you just never know what happens in those four or five days. Um, and um, we can, there's so many different scales of valuing and, and figuring out what um, makes a fair successful um, and, and definitely sort of um, things like, you know, introducing a work to an enthusiastic curator and that and potentially like or an institution. Yeah, exactly. And, and having a great conversation, which then could lead to um, a group show or a solo show or an acquisition or a catalog or et cetera, et cetera. So, so those things um, um, factor in, in terms of what, how we scale the value of a fair. Mm -hmm. um, and often it doesn't happen, you know, during that week. It happens months, if not years after. So even, you know, a private collector who might see something um, in one fair, then sees it in another fair, then sees it in another fair, then sees it in a museum, then sees it in the gallery, and then, you know, three years later, then might buy something. Mm -hmm. So it's it's difficult to kind of um, figure out what. Is there, is there a, I, I, it's actually a really interesting conversation. It, it wasn't even in my notes, but I think it's a really nice thing to explore. Uh, well, it's quite an important aspect of the art world, uh, mm. the, the fair. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, maybe we should stay on this for a bit. Do, do you observe fairs changing? Or are you able to see fairs kind of developing in maybe geographical areas where they haven't existed before? and therefore you're tapping into a new market or? That's a good question. I'm not, uh, fairs have, I think what galleries look for in a fair has changed mm -hmm. in general. Like I think historically 
when you think of a fair, um, fairs developed in the 60s and, you know, we can think of um, um, really kind of as, a, as an outgrowing of, of a trade show, right? In the classical sense of trade show. So you've got like art cologne in the 60s um, and the cologne and messe that developed. And, and, and so when you think about where previously you would you know, the art world is such a smaller kind of market and audience back in the 60s and 70s that you would go to a fair um, to reconnect with a, a small um, group of people who are interested in contemporary art in that kind of way. Um, and, you know, it, it's about selling, but also kind of reconnecting. Um, while I think increasingly in the last, I would say 10 to 15 years, um, if not 20 years, um, the audience for contemporary art um, has grown. Um, so you could meet new people now <laughs> in a fair, um, particularly people who um, have just started collecting. And there is a kind of, of course, an educational process that develops. Um, institutions have grown as well, particularly in, in places like East and Southeast Asia. And so um, you have um, great um, curators and collectors building institutional collections in a rapid state. So, so um, what we are looking for and um, for a fair, it, it depends on, on which ones mm -hmm. we do and, and what we want to present and what we want to get out of it. And I think um, some fairs have, have been receptive to that and understand that they are um, that they are that place for those specific things that a gallery needs and an artist needs, really. And then um, some fairs haven't, I think. The one is being how, how fairs have changed, right? Or how are they changing? Or do you encounter some exciting developments? Mm -hmm. and, and the second question is the geographical, oh, yes. geographical right. point. Yeah. I kind of touched on the second bit of it. But, um, have fairs sort of changed in an exciting way? Not really. I think in general, there are certain kind of accoutrements, you know, like artist projects um, looking at sort of having different sectors um, dealing with historical work, etc., cetera, um, which um, are very positive and interesting for an audience member. And for us, when we think about applying to fairs, um, I, I, but ultimately in the end, you know, a good fair is one that is um, like a kind of what one looks for in a good trade show, right? Like yeah. it's well organized, it's in a nice location, the air conditioning works. Air conditioning, yes. Um, shippers don't have a problem um, heading in or out and it's not going to cost a huge amount of money. They don't charge you for extra things secretly that they, you didn't know about. Um, but in the end, that's, and you know, they, you know, they bring in interesting audiences through the VIP programs, mm. et cetera, which also is very important. Um, some fairs um, also even um, uh, help um, institutional curators come by providing financial support, et cetera, mm -hmm. which is also really good. Um, but I think this geographical differences have become more um, important and more um, 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 interesting in some ways. Yeah. So you yeah. have um, a kind of um, the way that um, a fair um, reacts to it's different localities. You have, um, you know, Art Basel, who uh, has four distinct fairs. Um, and, um, you know, the one in Hong Kong is very specifically geared toward Asia Pacific region. The one mm -hmm. is geared specifically more for a pan American kind of context. And you've got Paris mm -hmm. and Basel, um, which is very European. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, then as a, I guess then as a gallery, you, you actually have to approach it in a very specific way based on the sort of geography. And as you've already said, institutions that exist in that area. Yes. And then perhaps you need to frame your artists in a 
in a in a specific way. No, we've never really we don't really ask an artist to how to make a work or make specific work for specific things. It's something that um, we as a gallery don't. I meant more how you in a way, I meant more how you talk about the work or how you sort of mm -hmm. present the work or not. Yes and no. I think it just depends. I think what we'd like to do is if there is a certain um, if an artist makes a specific kind of work, or not specific kind of work, but let's say um, there's a specific set of projects that might be more interesting to, for example, an American curator rather than a European curator. It's something that we might wanna prioritize doing something in America and show that work. Mm -hmm. um, I think in general, um, it's more about what um, the feeling, it's kind of, it's hard to just kind of quantify. Mm -hmm. It's often sort of a vibe and, and sort of showing a specific work um, um, or specific series to an audience that might already be attuned. Yeah. Um, but um, it's something new, you know, for them. Um, or it could be an artist or a set of series of projects that hasn't been seen in the region that we want to draw particular attention to, which is also very important. Mm -hmm. I think as you know, there is definitely a global, um, let's say marketplace mm -hmm. for art as we find out, but each um, region, each world, each country um, have their own histories mm -hmm. that we need to be very aware of and attuned about. And um, and that's sort of what we often do. That's another reason why we travel is to constantly be looking, learning, and seeing the connections and mm -hmm. seeing if something um, might spark. Yeah, in the area. It reminds me. It reminds me of that artwork from the Peggy Guggenheim in Venice. I think it's uh, Maurizio Nannucci says. Changing place, changing time, changing thought, changing future in, in neon. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there is something really important about just moving, right? And changing mm -hmm. place. And, but then actually maybe the question, the interesting question is the place where you are, right? Mm -hmm. So we talk a lot about the places where you go, but is there an artist that you think is really important to be seen in London right now? Or what artists do you think you would say now mm. is to be seen in this place where you where we are? I mean, surely you, you have an exhibition at the gallery or something, you would probably point to that artist. Yeah. I mean, obviously the artist at the gallery um, in London, I think there is definitely um, an important um, um, I think they're all kind of, um, they're all important for very specific reasons to be shown in London. And I think um, when I think about uh, the program, that is also something that I think about very, um, for, you know, when we um, invite an artist to, do, to work in the program or to be part of the program, it's something that um, we do think about, this idea of urgency, like mm -hmm. about, um, it's a bit different, of course, because we, we work um, and is a represented gallery. So it's a longer term conversation where we're um, much more about um, artist management, let's say. We kind of think about um, their careers, the work they do, support the work that they do in terms of production, in terms of marketing, communication, et cetera sales um and so it's a it's a longer term um relationship mm -hmm. that i think it's less maybe about an artist and maybe more about um if a certain series is urgent at this very second in time or moment in time um, I also think about less maybe London specific, but also um, because who I am, like a, a, a much more of a kind of East-West, school, North, school, South conversation. So for example, when we um, think about an artist like 
Harumi Yamaguchi, who's in her 80s, she's a Japanese artist in the 80s, who developed a body of work in the 70s, 80s, and 90s as part of, as being a creative director of Pakro, which is a Japanese department store lifestyle magazine. She produced these amazing um, uh, spray paint on uh, canvas paintings that then became advertising uh, images for the department's um, uh, uh, advertising campaigns, promotional events, and, and even um, uh, television advertisements that wow. was in the late 80s, 90s. So this was a moment that was quite revolutionary in Japan, uh, kind of a woman at work presenting images of women at work and play and doing it within the context of um, uh, the commercial, like it was done as a kind of commercial advertising yeah. project, which then, you know, as we were, we were trying to um, resuscitate as um, an artist. At what point did, does she become an artist? Does, did she become an artist in the 90s or did she kind of clearly oh. become? That's a very interesting and, and, and kind of quite problematic concept, right? Because I think, you know, when you are, um, particularly in the context of Japan, it's quite difficult to be a professional or the concept of what is a professional artist is, is a question, and particularly a, a professional female artist. And um, so it's ne there's never been like a coming out, let's say, uh, but also her work, which I find really interesting, doesn't necessarily follow the kind of trajectory, let's say, of when you think about contemporary art in Japan, even though Japanese artists and curators do see it. And, and you know, someone like Murakami-san, um, you know, um, is an avid fan of, of Harumi uh, because there were definitely tangents of that work that inspired the kawaii, kind of super flat renaissance that came out of Japan in the, in the 90s, I wanna say, and maybe a little earlier. Um, so there's definitely um, a sense of that, you know, um, but it is this, but I think what you kind of raise is, is this something that is also something that I think about quite a lot, um, which is this idea of professionalization, like what, you know, we as a gallery, the concept of at least a kind of represent gallery that represents artists in a long period of time is a kind of relatively new concept that emerged in the same way that artists have become a professional, have professionalized. I mean, isn't, it, isn't it a nice thought that in a way you can ask yourself a question, where, where can I find an artist? Um, like in many places, not necessarily always at the degree show of, a, yes. of an institution. Yes, no, absolutely. I think it's um, um, it's definitely um, something that, or, or so actually even like artists that maybe, um, let's say, never um, or stopped being artists. So you have Harumi, you have someone like Hal Fisher, who we work with, who made a very specific series of works in the, in the um, just uh, basically between 75 and 78, 79, and then became a curator. You know, he basically did the first Tibetan show in San Francisco and, um, or at least actually in America about Tibetan art. Um, so, and then um, through working with his, um, with a gallery at, in, in LA and then through us, Reemerged and re has been rediscovered um, in some ways. So it's this sort of. Um, and has he started to make new work or, or, no. or no? No, no, no. I mean, there is a kind of. Um, he did recently a kind of commission with the New York Times where he revisited um, his series Gay Semiotics, which is a kind of one of the first sort of photography and language works that dealt with trying to bring together the idea of, of image and language together um, through semiotics and through a kind of very kind of comedic understanding of semiotics. Um, he did a project with the New York Times where he chose um, three images 
um, I think it was Timothée Chalamet, um, uh, Harry Styles and Bad Bunny and did a kind of deconstruction of what they were wearing to think about, um, what is it called again? Gay baiting? Or, or, or it's that kind of when um, um, apparently cis straight men um, perform a certain kind of queerness to attract um, a larger queer audience. Um, but no, he's not um, interested. I think he's, he's really, mm -hmm. I think there was just a moment where he has, um, he felt that um, he primarily stopped working precisely because of uh, the advent of AIDS. Mm -hmm. Like he felt that the work that he was making, particularly the kind of humorous side of it, mm -hmm. was something that he couldn't translate mm -hmm. to an AIDS audience or to an AIDS, sorry, um, era, mm -hmm. which of course we're still going through um, even with PrEP. Um, so it's something that um, he's thought of, but he hasn't really mm -hmm. backed and up. What is, what, is, what is the most interesting place where you have found an artist? Or, mm -hmm. or to give you a bit more <laughs> uh, <laughs> space, how do you look? And I don't want to say for an artist, because it might be the artwork that you discover first. Mm -hmm. So how do you look? Yeah. And, yeah. It's generally the artwork first. Mm -hmm. um, we do sometimes, I mean, I think the best recommendation an artist um, um, for to look at an artist is, is when an, one of our artists suggests another artist. Mm -hmm. um, that's always the best recommendation uh, for us. And then otherwise we look, and that's another reason why we travel and look a lot. Um, it's, and so what's the most interesting place uh, where you have encountered that's a good question artwork or um, artists? I have to think about that because mm -hmm. it's the usual I, I don't remember I mean most of the places that we we do find is through things like social media through um, you know uh, biennials graduating mm -hmm. program so in some sense it's a quite selected yeah I guess social media maybe has a has a capacity to present an artist that maybe hasn't gone through that sort of institutional uh, training. There is a certain kind of democracy of images, but it's also you know trying to. Um, it's it's always quite difficult, right? Because it's always just um, certain things that look good. Yes. Yeah. Um, it looks great. One, in one of the interviews of yours that I've read, you're described as an infiltrator, which I thought was quite interesting. <laughs> they yeah. infiltrated the art world through a gallery in May, through a garage in Mayfair. Mm. Uh, but I, I was I just wanted to to hear whether you feel like a like an intruder. Um no, not mm. at all. Like I feel like I'm very classically. Um, my story entering the art world is quite classic in mm -hmm. some way, or at least one of the classic stories. Okay. You know, um, um, you know one classic story is like, for example, like, you know, being trained in the art world or the art, art galleries because you're parents worked in them or your parents were collectors and therefore you understood that was not necessarily my story um I, I grew up from in a very kind of immigrant I started like working class but sort of working middle class let's say in in Long Beach California and mm. I don't even remember um us going to museums or looking at contemporary art and I think I didn't really even it's not really my um it wasn't I mean, visual arts were always sort of interesting. Like I, I, I was fascinated with movies and films. Mm -hmm. Actually, did some video work, um, terrible video artwork, Marco, when I was in school and college. But um, I, the classic story is more. Um, I was dating an artist. Okay. And I learned about what an art gallery is. 
through that. You were confused when you when you dated the artist. Were you really were you intrigued and confused and suspicious about it? Um, it was a strange time, let's say, because for me personally, because I was actually doing a PhD at Columbia. Okay. Um, I was thinking about becoming an academic or I had planned to become an academic. And um, basically I had a kind of crisis of conscience and faith. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of, yeah, failed, I yeah, I failed like my orals and I just sort of hated academia and I hated teaching, particularly at that level of Ivy League undergraduate students. And, um, and I was kind of took a break from academia or my PhD program and um, worked in retail to pay the rent. And then um, the artist friend was said, oh, um, was talking about galleries. And I didn't really know. I mean, I knew there was, it was different between, I understood the difference between private and public, but I didn't know what a commercial art gallery does. Right. Right. And so, um, the artist was like, well, what encouraged me to apply for this internship? And I did. And um, that led to um, another kind of assistant kind of internship job. And, um, and then I realized, oh, this is something that actually kind of fits um, uh, my interests. Let's say I was, of course, interested in visual arts. Um, and I learned art history about myself. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and it had kind of interests. It had sort of things that I thought were I was good at. I was good at research. I was good at looking. I was good at thinking. Um, what, were the first, <laughs> what were the first prompts in art history that you were extremely passionate about? I took this randomly when I was an undergrad. I took this class. Um, I sat in on this class by Tim Clark, um, T.J. Clark, who taught a modernist course on. Um, it was meant to be a survey of Mormonism, but basically he just focused on three artists and one of them was um, Mondrian. Mm -hmm. And I was quite kind of obsessed with these conversations about um, very formal, let's say conversations about flatness and looking, but then always contextualized within a certain kind of historical um, element. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I was very much um, earlier, like quote unquote, trained or seduced by a, a very specific kind of Western New York um, slash Paris slash Berlin mm -hmm. clone kind of art history, um, um, which then I quickly um, um, felt needed to be um, complicated. So in that sense, I was interested in that. So there was a moment where you also saw that history as problematic or something mm -hmm. that had to be... Of course. I mean, I think it's, um, it's hard to deny, right? Because I think so much of the conversation um, is rooted in that history. Um, and, and today, even today, you, can, you, you hear a lot of... of of that, um, but then, you know, what's interesting when maybe this brings back to your question about London is that the UK and London has a very specific history, which I was so confused by when I first moved here in 2010. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, you know, there were certain greats like Patrick Caulfield, et cetera. And um, even sort of the, um, the, you know, that I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, and, and that kind of results in um, a different kind of contemporary art, art, a contemporary art that is being produced here, mm -hmm. um, which makes it interesting. Uh, Even though you came here with, a, with already an, a, an understanding and a position, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but then you, you could be critical towards what you encountered. Mm, yes, but also like it was very, um, you know, it was very, like, I could see the strands, like when you see someone like Richard Hamilton, mm -hmm. who's probably, I would say, one of my favorite artists, um, uh, his, the conceptual rigor, um, the way that by the same time he plays, um, there's a certain kind of humor 
in his um, minimalism and um, that I find um, so unique and uniquely British, let's say. And then you have someone like Stephen Willits, who's a contemporary of, of Hal Fisher um, and his sort of um, take on photography and language, which he was doing at the same time. Um, again, it's a very different kind of humor, but it has very similar results, let's say in terms of particularly kind of breaking up the image, et cetera, so. I think that's such a nice point to um, identifying humor as something quite rooted in, in the work. And it's something that I also, being a foreigner um, arriving to this country, have also encountered and in fact really love this, the subtleties of that mm -hmm. um, humor. And uh, um, even when the work is very self-referential, that there, there is a there's such a fine humor. I mean, I'm just now thinking of one of the people that I'll be talking to as part of this uh, group of uh, interviews. Uh, that's the filmmaker John Smith, mm -hmm. uh, who, of course, has so much humor in his work, but but also that very specific British humor. The the, the very yeah. observation can be mm -hmm. point at which something starts to unfold or kind of trick um, the viewer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's, and I feel like it's more and more important when we talk about this, you know, just referencing regions and why we continue to travel and why we can't simply depend on like social media, etc. Is that, you know, there are, I mean, when we think about globalization, it's kind of like flattening out a lot and the kind of the way in which contemporary art um, <clears throat> increasingly or potentially the critique is that whatever art increasingly is looking the same right because of the way in which um you know certain forums chooses certain things in the way that um certain things are being taught um and and what people are receiving as contemporary art but um when you kind of look it's actually continues to be quite I, um, I, this is often very um, shaded, but I think it's important. It's like it's 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 um, it still hopefully maintains a certain kind of regionality, of provin provinciality in a good kind of way, in the way that Raymond Mark, uh, Raymond Williams would talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of specialness of the locality, which mm -hmm. is important, mm -hmm. yeah. and something that we still need to understand as as outsiders. And, and I guess it's also important then how do we frame that work that we encounter somewhere else? How do we then make sure that we are true to the intention or the authenticity of the artist that we don't fetishize it or that we don't, you know, culturally mm -hmm. appropriate things? It's, it's mm -hmm. a really uh, difficult uh, mm -hmm. task, especially to people like you. <laughs> What do you mean, Marco? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, people who operate, who are curators, who operate commercially, and who support these artists. So, so it's a, it's a, an ethical thin line that, just thinking of it, sounds like a difficult balance to maintain. Yes, I mean, I think what the way that I sort of understand is that I think um, it, it's. Maybe that's why I call the gallery project Native Informant. <laughs> but also, oh, I think. <laughs> anyway. Uh, um, but, you know, this is exactly um, one of the reasons, mm -hmm. you know, why is because um, it's a question of translation. Yeah. And I think uh, particularly the West sees the other or things that they don't are not. Um, not of the West in a in a purely sociological mm -hmm. way, logical way, right? It's kind of interesting because um, I mean, this is what I was gonna what I wrote my dissertation on, which mm -hmm. I published. But it's it was about this in the in American Academy. It was about um, the development of area studies, sort of like South Asia studies, East Asia studies, things like that as departments, as core group of sociological um, uh, programs that were meant to um, learn about the other in a very um, not anthropological, was an attempt to be a non-anthropological way, um, more scientific way, 
um, particularly um, in the kind of post-independence and uh, post-empire world, uh, that is the Cold War. And then you have um, in literature, in literature departments, an embrace of bel which is a sort of very anti-theoretical, close reading. But what I, it's, it's meant to be reducing a research, reducing this sort of concept of, of otherness, right? It's just purely about the text. But then um, in both cases, it's about this idea of close reading. Mm -hmm. right? It's about like learning more about this thing that you don't know about and then retrieving data out of it in some ways, right? To, perform, to make reading to research. Um, and, and that is, it's, it's, it's a struggle, right? I mean, you, you even today with institutional, um, with institutions in particular, um, which is why I think I never, I never felt that being a curator in a public institution was open to me. Um, and that's why I kind of went to the pop commercial side is it didn't feel, it, it, there is still a, a kind of rudeness that, you know, you, if you are, um, someone who is not white and not cis, et cetera, then you must perform that 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 you represent. Like um, I can't be, you know, an expert in the Baroque, for example. That would just be ridiculous. Um, they wouldn't say that, but um, at least that's kind of, but it is meant to be, you're meant to perform who you are. And I felt that the gallery, you know, we've always, the gallery is very much about me and well, very much about my, let's say, interests. And so it developed very much naturally based on um, what I was looking at. And of course the relationships with the artist. So it was never going, it was always going to be quite international. It was going to be quite a dialogue between the global north and the global south and because it's, it's who I am. Um, but it's interesting, yeah, it is about different kinds of translation. And just to go back in terms of your question about our affairs. I think translation, translation is, a, is, a, is actually a really interesting word mm -hmm. because it does imply that there is a method attached to it. It's not just purely, uh, it might be intellectual, but it's not just purely taking something and placing it on a pedestal, but it's thinking about how do we intellectually engage with an object? Yes, talking about the object, talking about the audience, right? Trying to find a certain kind of understanding there's multiple languages, multiple ways of communicating. Um, and it's not about like dumbing down or whatever. It is very much about trying to connect, trying to connect, finding something to connect with. Um, for that, for the audience, mm -hmm. for that person is hearing. Um, I feel like you've said it, but but you know, with your experience in in the private art world, uh, the galleries, and then starting your own, I'm sure there is a there is something about what you've just described. This almost like a decentralizing of, I guess, theoretical approach geographically. Mm -hmm an artwork, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there might also be a, a response to the world of art that you encountered. Uh, how is your gallery a response to what perhaps doesn't work so well in the current landscape of, of, of commercial art galleries? Now, that's a good question. I, I, the way that I developed my program and it's interesting now that we are looking back a little bit, um, which is something that I kind of hate, this idea of nostalgia, but looking back um, now, because we are just celebrating a 10th anniversary as a gallery. And so we um, have organized this group show um, featuring work by each of our artists, which is great because it's, it's always something um, that I thought about. Um, and I envision in my mind, but so it's great to kind of materialize it in the galleries. Um, that it has, at least in, for me, a, a kind of unique perspective. And 
I would say it's less responding to the art world and more about how um, there are, of course, audiences that are, um, I found that, that have appreciated or, or respond to um, the program. Mm -hmm. And what I've also noted is, is the fact that the artists all live in the world and they're responding to the present mm -hmm. um, in all its vagaries, so um, in multiplicities. Um, and also, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a bit, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know what this art world is either. Like, there's so many, you know, you think about um, at this conversation recently with a, with a young gallerist, <clears throat> um, in London and, and they just wanted some advice and they asked me about the art market it's a typical question and I said well which market right there's multiple markets and some there's there's I mean, the concave kind of graphs there's some that connect and others that don't so it just depends I don't I don't know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then when it comes to institutions right institutions are uh, these bastions of culture mm. that are in many instances flawed and desperately need to be rethought. But in a way, as you previously said, you're supporting your artists and in some way they are being channeled towards these places because in some way, even though they do need uh, sort of to be transformed, that transformation will only happen by, by you know, a more diverse uh, body of art, tests producing art that then ends up there that actually ch challenges mm -hmm. those narratives that exist within those institutions. So how do you then, uh, I was just wondering and, and just wanted to explore a little bit your relationship to institutions and where do you see a potential for generating some change or or how is that done that's a difficult one i mean um for very obvious reasons we um very much engage with public institutions it's something that is important for artists for numerous reasons i mean it, it it's you know i think a good gallery and i hope we are one of them um is one that provides multiplicity of opportunities for artists that we work with. And that includes public institutions, doing shows, engaging um, with it in some way. Um, and um, uh, obviously there, there are certain, you know, benefits to that. I mean, context, cultural capital, et cetera. Um, but also it's, it could provide um, uh, a potentiality for an artist to do a project that we cannot do in the galleries for whatever reason, space, finance, etc. So it's important for us. Um, how we engage is, is in multiple ways, you know. Um, um, we of course have conversations, we have um, viewings, we talk about our artists, um, propose things, um, send them books, et cetera, as we would normally do. And, um, and then um, if things happen and there's something that might, um, there's a project that happens in the public institution, then we um, provide a myriad of, of activities or a support, which includes, um, providing images, um, liaising with the artist and the curator. Um, often, often some curators take yourself out, you know, um, become a translator. <laughs> um, we also do some fundraising, mm -hmm. that's also very important. Um, so we try as best as we can to help um, um, with budgets, because that's also something that is increasingly becoming, or it has always been, difficult, even yeah. in the best of times. Um, but even now, it's mm -hmm. even worse with the Arts Council um, mm -hmm. restrictions, et cetera. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, working with them in the catalog. Um, so there's there's um, a lot of different ways that we can work. We would do work with institutions. How we affect change within that, I, I cannot say. You know, I, I don't feel, I feel like that is something um, that um, we try, particularly with, um, you know, an acquisition and hopefully something um, where um, a work um, by an artist of color particularly gets into a collection that maybe isn't fully representative, representative of the population. Um, but, you know, long-term change and things like that, it's, it, it's something that it's, it's hard to explain. Like, I don't necessarily feel like it's not my responsibility. I do feel like as a active art participant mm -hmm. in this world, I do feel that there is a certain responsibility, but as a gallery, it's something that's quite difficult. Okay, but, but as you yourself, mm -hmm. when you walk into these, let's call them institutions, how, how do you feel? Um, on a personal level, um, depends, you know, I think um, if I go to something that is maybe not necessarily contemporary art, I feel um, less of a pressure, let's say, to think about like more professional duties, let's say. Um, when I look at um, exhibitions or museums that deal particularly with contemporary art, I think about, um, let's say other things, you know, potentially, um, like what is space, what is the show, um, who are those curators, do I know? The level of this course and... Yes, so, um, and you know, there are some biennials that I see and I think, oh, it's like an art fair kind of thing. So that's also something I think I see. And, and then, you know, some spaces make it quite alien. Some spaces are much more welcoming. It just depends. Um, and then, yeah, some spaces we have connections with because we're close to the curator, et cetera. And some we don't know and want to know. Um, we don't. <laughs> yeah. I've always, I've only went to my first um, Venice Art Biennale mm. last time it was held. Um, and yeah. pre, pre COVID, because I always go to the architecture, because I always go to the architecture Biennale, right? Oh, yes. That's also really great. Yeah. That's the, the real, the real discovery was that in the, yeah. when, I saw the art, when I saw the Art Biennale for the first time, mm. I thought, wow, this is incredible. I think that architects should be going to the art biennale. <laughs> and art, art, artists should be going to the architects. Yes, yes. You know, I've actually suggested, I've had a few people, um, one of the sort of our artists who um, I work with, and I've always encouraged them actually to go to the Architectural Association graduating show. Yes, Just the way the that it's kind of done, um, the kind of preciseness of things. Mm. Um, I do. I completely agree. And the production quality, uh, like level of production. I mean, our architects are. I think one one big difference between artists and architects is that architects are committed to production, which isn't always healthy. But then art sometimes uh, struggles with that yeah. sort of giving birth to something. Yes. Uh, yeah, there is sometimes this idea of um, well, I produce the work. I don't need to install it. And mm -hmm. I think, um, particularly with solo something, this is mostly with, with an artist, younger artists that we work with, um, or used or, or we have to kind of um, um, remind um, that it, it inhabits a space, right? And the exhibition itself, particularly a solo one, is, is itself a kind of artwork. Yes. So it's equally as important to kind of think about. But actually communicating work is 
is the work in some way or another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of why, um, you know, we were very much um, hands on in terms of working with them in the exhibition, in terms of installing them. We always have a kind of carte blanche in terms of the press release. That's very important. Mm -hmm. So um, they have multiple options. They can write themselves. They can um, uh, commission another person, or we can write one for them, or we can write one together. Um, and we often spend more time on writing the press release than um, installing. Because, installing you know, the show. Well, sometimes, in, like an artist already, like when they come into space, particularly one that they know, and it's just like, mm -hmm. done, done. Now let's talk about the work, like what I'm gonna talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and often, again, this is a question of translation, like mm -hmm. the visual language and, and written language are two very different things. So when someone is so deeply trained in visual language, try to kind of translate that into a press release. It's, it's very different. Yeah. Um, and particularly one that is, if you think about, um, um, uh, um, uh, the press release that is that is, that is a kind of the template press release, right? Like it's very artificial. Yeah. It's it's less for the artist almost. It's it's more absolutely, for, but it's but it's exactly that point of of communicating to the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The world uh, has a, a level of understanding. Yeah. Which, uh... Absolutely, and art fairs um, to go back is is a very artificial environment. Yeah. Artists. And I always sort of say, particularly when I start working with an artist and they've never done an art fair, particularly a solo one, I also would say like, you're gonna hate it. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I wouldn't say that, but like, it's a very different mindset. Yeah. It's a very different concept. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's certain things that work and certain things that don't. Um, and it's less to do with like their work and it's much to do with, the way that you engage making it happen in that space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the lighting is very artificial. These walls, which are then open to other walls with other art is really weird. You know, uh, the fact that you only have um, two days to install where, for example, an exhibition, you have maybe a week or two weeks, etc. It's a very kind of short span and you kind of have to make decisions very quickly. Um, and and yeah, and you can't like do it at night, for example. You have to like. But also, 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 the way in which you speak to all these people that come through your booth is very much. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to kind of. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Oh. I, mean, I think it's a different. Um, sometimes you have to kind of give. Um, well, you need to adjust your language. You need to yes, adjust your language. a bit. Yeah, like I think. Um, I think it's a very quick thing. So you have to kind of be very brief and very um, bullet pointy in a way that sometimes, um, you know, you would prefer a narrative instead of, yeah. Um, it's interesting you say that, so that you send them to the um, AA to, to look at the end of your show, but, but I wonder whether there is any other ref important references for you. And this is not a place or an artist, but, but just culturally, uh, things that um, that are dear to you, uh, whether it's film or, mm -hmm. or architecture, or, or what are those things that you really are passionate about, or that in some way mm -hmm. inform your thinking, mm -hmm. creativity? Mm -hmm. um, most of our artists um, have a, well, actually all of our artists have a very deep passion for film. Mm -hmm. That's something, the language that we talk about. It's, it's the world of film, right? And film art, and video. Um, and that's definitely um, something that we, we connect with. Literature mm -hmm. is really special. So there's certain, um, you know, summer, this is the period of summer reading where we talk about what we're going to take on our vacations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are having them. Uh, but they're definitely sort of, um, uh, and also just popular culture in general. Like I think a lot of artists work in, in within culture and so you have you know like a collective like this who um um you know if they're not working on their own art they're curating of course other people's artists 
um, and the sort of artists um, doing video art for this dot art, but also two of them um, have um, a, a kind of commercial um, photography slash video uh, production company called Torso, and they do, um, well, they used to actually do all the Burberry advertisements, for example, they now do Mugler. So it's, it's they're all kind of um, very much cultural producers mm -hmm. outside of art, let's say, and they write and they do films, etc. cetera. Sophia Maria um, is another one who, um, she just recently had a, um, a couple years ago, um, um, a, a limited television series done of her, um, where she wrote um, uh, uh, um, a mini series about the early life of um, Anais Nin, or inspired by the early life of Anais Nin. Um, so, um, really, everything. Stefan, what's what's that uh, what's that work behind you? Been revealed slowly as you moved. Um, at start, it looked like a shadow. Um, it's a it's a an, 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 uh, unique photograph by a collective called Dis, um, which are New York based. Mm. Um, they started off as a um, this magazine, which you might know, and then they have this now this online edutainment platform called Dis.Art, which I recommend everyone to subscribe. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an image from um, taken as a behind the scenes image from um, a recent film they did um, called Everything But the World, which is um, a long term film project, a long format film project about tracing um, um, the human from um, the, the cave. And so this is a kind of cave person, um, a person in, with thick mud and paint um, to today um, and thinking about how um, the mechanics of the body of, of concept and thinking has it changed so much since um, the time of the Neolithic era mm -hmm. to today where you have the mechanized um, Amazon worker constantly just doing one thing without a break.